Welcome, everybody. I'm Walter Isaacson, and thank you all for being here. Uh, this one is a real pleasure for me because I deeply admire all three people on this platform and the fact that they seem to have gotten together for a really interesting book, which you can get outside, which is um, about how you can transcend some of the really partisan and non-data-driven uh, ways that we look at government and use both data and common sense uh, to find certain solutions. Most of you know Bridge. John Bridgeland um, chairs or oversees the Franklin Project of the Aspen Institute, but he's got uh, many other hats. Uh, the Franklin Project is our one-year service year uh, drive with uh, General Stan McChrystal, John Bridgeland, Alan Casey, uh, and others running it. Uh, but Bridge uh, worked at uh, the, Bush White, uh, the Bush, the Younger White House as? Director of Domestic Policy Council. Oh, yeah, Domestic, uh, Domestic Policy Council. Uh, Peter Orzag was the Director of the Office of Management and Budget in um, the first term of President Obama, is at Citigroup, and uh, has also been a good friend of the Aspen Institute. Michael Gerson is at the One Campaign, and of course is best known to all of us as a columnist and, and the Washington Post, and also a writer. And so I turn it to Michael, who I think is indeed the moderator, although mm -hmm. uh, this is a panel without moderators. Everybody has ideas here, but thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, it, it really is an honor to be here on this important uh, topic. Um, for the past several years, we have had a rather fruitless, binary, national debate on the size and role of government. Uh, government has often been a yes or no question. Uh, some oppose it, some seem indifferent to its failures, and it sometimes obscured an urgent goal. How do we make the government we need achieve the human outcomes we require? And that's our topic today. Uh, tying funding to performance, not just for the sake of efficiency, but for the sake of compassion. Making government play money ball, as uh, our participants will explain. So let me start by thanking the Aspen Institute and Alma and Joseph Gilderhorn for making this event possible. And thanks to Results for America, led by Michelle uh, Jolin, for your leadership role in this work. Um, our panelists today are uh, the bipartisan authors of Moneyball for Government, which is going to be available after this event, and the best possible experts to discuss these issues. Uh, Walter mentioned a little bit of this, but I'll go into a little more detail. Peter Orzag is the Vice Chairman of Corporate and Investment Banking, Chairman of the Public Sector Group, and Chairman of the Financial Strategy and Solutions Group at Citibank. He previously served as director of the Office of Management and Budget in the Obama administration and as director of the Congressional, Congressional Budget Office. John Bridgeland is CEO of Civic Enterprises and co-chair of the Franklin Project here at the Aspen Institute to make a service year a common expectation and opportunity for all 18 to 28 year olds. He previously served as the director of the White House Domestic Policy Council in the first term of President George W. Bush and a member of the White House Council for Community Solutions under President Obama. And I was just recalling yesterday that I actually spent years nagging John to produce better policy for the State of the Union address, which I <laughs> had produced at the White House. And he often came through in that, uh, in that role. So let me uh, dive right in. Uh, Peter, what is Moneyball? And what's the problem in government Moneyball could help address? Well, uh, one way of characterizing the problem is that a, a GAO uh, survey in 2013 suggested that only 37% of federal government managers had had any evaluation of any program that they uh, were involved with uh, over the past five years. That's amazing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another 40% weren't sure whether any evaluations had been done, so that's also <laughs> interesting. Um, <laughs> And I think therein lies the problem, which is that we are flying blind in an era where we don't need to be. Um, it's understandable, perhaps, that historically, when the cost of undertaking uh, 
rigorous examinations was higher and the cost of uh, aggregating data and gathering data was higher, that we didn't do as much of it as one would have liked. But those excuses don't exist anymore. And so especially in an era where we are on track to <clears throat> hit the lowest uh, non-defense discretionary spending share of GDP <clears throat> ever, um, we are, both parties have agreed to a path for uh, discretionary spending in particular that will become increasingly hard to meet. We should be very careful about how, what programs are expanded, what programs are cut. And the only way to do that is to rigorously evaluate what works and what doesn't. And that's what Moneyball is all about. Great. It's hard for me to be thinking about the next question because I'm writing notes for a column already. This is <laughs> good. Uh, that's, that's pretty extraordinary. Uh, uh, Bridge, like uh, Peter, you worked in uh, uh, with the Congress and the White House. Does Peter's answer reflect your experience? Was that how you saw it? It does. I, in 2003, I was the uh, co-chair of the White House Task Force for Disadvantaged Youth. And we were looking at the federal response to help the 15 million young people in the country at risk of not reaching productive adulthood and many of thousands of young people who age out of the foster care system and uh, the millions of Americans who are disconnected from school and employment. And the executive director came into my office and said, Bridge, there are 339 federal programs across 12 departments and agencies spending $224 billion a year to help this population. I thought, I thought there was a little trick in my hearing. And uh, as we looked more deeply into these programs, we discovered that most of them did not have uh, any rigorous evaluations behind them. Uh, there was information and data on inputs, on outputs, on the number of people who were being served uh, with a program, but very little in terms of how those programs actually changed life outcomes. So we made recommendations in the report, but it was the first really wake-up call to me that the government was flying by. And P Peter also likes to say that, you know, we, in our article we say one out of every $100 spent by the federal government's backed by even the most basic evidence uh, that it's working. There was an evaluation since 1990 of 11 uh, large-scale social programs spending $10 billion annually, and 10 out of 11 of them had, had weak or no positive effects in terms of uh, outcomes. Now, that, that doesn't mean that we should just scrap those programs. We want to create an environment of continuous learning uh, from the evidence, but my experience, uh, again and again, unfortunately, reflects uh, the views that Peter expressed. So that's fairly somber news about government, but I want to test um, if there's something more optimistic here as well. Um, maybe both of you could address examples where government's doing things right, where they are playing money ball and making a, a difference, things that can, examples that can spur us on and give us hope. Yeah, I'll start. I mean, there's actually a great book uh, by Ron Haskins from um, Brookings that documents the progress that's been made. So we're starting from a very low base, but uh, there is progress being made. Um, and I would highlight uh, as one example what the Department of Education is doing in gathering evidence-based policymaking along a couple different dimensions. One is to have a chief evaluation officer so that <laughs> departmental staff uh, in lots of different areas that are not used to interpreting, you know, randomized control trials and other things have a better sense of a person to turn to for help in, in uh, assessing what the evidence actually says. And the second thing which is very important is putting together a clearinghouse of what all the various studies out there are saying so that there's one go-to place that you can, you can uh, you know, tap into to get all of the most recent evidence uh, ranked by kind of quality uh, on a particular topic. And then the final piece has to be in uh, then applying all of that. And that's where um, we're making some progress, but um, more needs to be done. The other thing I'd say about all of this is uh, you had mentioned Michelle Jolin's organization. There is also the um, Coalition for Evidence-Based Policymaking. There's a, uh, there's a, a group uh, out of uh, MIT that is now doing more randomized controlled trials about healthcare um, policy. There's more and more uh, organizations that are focused on this problem, and so that's also a sense of optimism. There was, there was an entire chapter in the economic report of the president uh, last year on evaluation. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that's the first time in history, mm -hmm. not that that. <laughs> right. 
we're starting from a low base. But again, um, so a lot of uh, a, a lot of actually grounds for optimism. I think the trick though becomes in the hard work of then actually taking this base of evidence and what have you that is starting to get built and applying it, in, especially in the budgeting process, so that we cut back the stuff that doesn't work and we expand the stuff that does. That's where it gets really hard because guess what? No one who's an advocate for a particular program wants to be told that their program doesn't work. And that that's where it gets difficult. Yeah, yeah just building, I think there are many examples, a rays of hope in terms of programs that have been effective and proven to be effective and then in turn scaled. One example I love is I think it was David Olds in Baltimore who had this idea to start what's called the Nurse Family Partnership and basically put nurses in the lives of low-income first-time mothers and to work with them, pregnancy, on health and nutrition of the child, even their educational and, and uh, employment outcomes. And he actually tested it in a rigorous manner in three communities. And it was so successful in terms of the outcomes that the program now scaled to 40 states. And I think the federal government spends about $1.5 billion every year in this program. And in terms of the cost-benefit analysis, extraordinary gains from a taxpayer standpoint in terms of the health outcomes for the mother, the child, and the attachment that mother makes to uh, education and employment. That's a program. What I love about what Peter says and what Michelle, Joel, and, and, and Shivam and the whole team at Results for America is focused on is what can we do systemically across government that will affect, um, basically put in place three principles, build an evidence base, move policy and practice and programs toward things that the evidence, rigorous evidence shows works. And third, direct funds. And this is the tough part. When Peter and I wrote that Atlantic piece and we actually called out a few programs that the evidence showed had not been effective, we, we got some office visits <laughs> and a lot of phone calls. So this is the tough part, uh, but an important part to be, I think, because um, as we say, this is Moneyball for government is the means to an end which is to boost social mobility and economic opportunity for young people and families and vulnerable populations. And another um, thing that we're advocating is, imagine taking 1% of the existing budgets of departments and agencies and having that invested in collecting and developing sophisticated evaluation so that you know as a taxpayer and as a policymaker and a stakeholder and a program developer, how the other $99, 99% of that funding actually is being spent, and marry that with chief evaluate, uh, evaluation officers, so you really could uh, systemically transform what government funds. You know, I, I see these uh, issues sometimes from a development perspective, and yeah. it's interesting that uh, DFID, the U UK uh, aid agency, has a built-in evaluation mechanism for their multilateral aid programs yes. by which every review period, it's not every year, but every review period, they drop programs at the bottom and add to programs at the top, the ones that gain like Gavi, which are tremendously successful programs. Um, it's interesting that I think the last time around the, progr the programs that were dropped were all UN programs, mm -hmm. which itself says something. Um, but uh, it, it builds political support for aid spending. <laughs> because people think their money is, is spent better. It's, yeah. It builds political support for government itself, which yeah. is kind of an interesting. Um, can, I, can I ask one question uh, that relates to that? There are some areas that must be inherently easy to measure. Okay, So in AIDS and malaria, you can measure the number of people who go on treatment. Prevention is pretty much a science. Um, if you're dealing with long-term economic development, um, there are a thousand different factors that go into it, and it has to be measured 10 years out. Okay. I'm just curious about what you've seen about wh whether some issues are much harder than others to kind of come up with that data on. I'll take the easier side just for a minute. I also want to ap yeah. applaud Mike Gerson because he's literally in the Oval Office when there's the discussion about whether the president ought to put um, $1.5 million into a, a president's malaria initiative. And Mike is the one that um, advocated, and I think pulled that off because uh, it was a debate. But interestingly, in malaria, um, 10 Nobel laureate economists had said it's the best return on investment on the planet. If uh, there are evidence-based interventions, four of them, one of them is the provision of bed nets, insecticide-treated bed nets. Um, the government was spending 
about $30 million on malaria, even though the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention was created to combat malaria in the United States. And then uh, when um, the evidence emerged and leadership emerged, and then there was a focus on where is malaria disproportionately found, how could you create plans in indigenous African countries that fostered partnerships to combat malaria, resources started flowing, and remarkably, 4.3 million lives have been saved, 4 million of which have been saved since 2005. Since the US government, in an environment that is not always um, sympathetic to foreign aid, stepped forward and mobilized not only its own resources, but the Global Fund, which provides you know, a significant percentage of the funding for uh, World Bank through the uh, Malaria Boosters Program. So it's a stunning example of how you could take a dramatic social problem, which is easy to measure and easy to, to track, and make a, 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 a significant difference. And uh, one of the, the parts of the agenda for uh, uh, Moneyball is to identify, with your help and the public's help, 10 social problems you could really make a dramatic difference on in, in the next 10 years. And malaria and AIDS are clearly two of them, but there are others as well. Can, can you, I don't want to get us off track, but can you address that different, that some, some social problems, some advocates for social problems will come to you and say, we're just harder to measure, okay? We're long term. We have you know, a lot of more different factors in it. I'm just curious what the response is to that. Why doesn't Moneyball just favor certain problems? Okay, Because they're easier to measure. Well, uh, a, a few things. First of all, uh, even on, let's take the impact of early childhood education, where the evidence suggests that there is some fade out effect on test scores, on educational uh, scores in uh, middle and high school, depending on the quality of those middle and high school. So th that's the classic problem of immediate impact, clearly very positive, a little bit of fade, and then how do you evaluate that? And what we've learned over the past five to 10 years is there are a whole variety of other positive indicators, even in adulthood, that come from being exposed to early, quality early childhood education. Uh, lower crime rates, higher college graduation rates, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's sort of like you know, it, uh, an evolutionary process of learning where the first thing you can measure is the immediate impact. Then you can measure some longer term impacts that are directly related. Right. And then finally, you get a broader set of, of uh, right. One of the legitimate concerns, and let's just also say there's no panacea here. One of the legitimate concerns of um, people who favor something like early childhood education is, well, what if you had Moneyball working when we were at the stage of kind of fade out being the dominant uh, yeah. empirical uh, finding? Would the programs then have been shut down. Um, and I think what that will speak to is when you have a very positive initial impact and then longer term things that are harder to measure, you should weight you, those less in the evaluation. So you're right to highlight there's some things we can measure well. I mean, the classic example is how are we going to evaluate the effectiveness, uh, you know, uh, the, how are you going to do money ball for a new fighter jet program or um, something in defense? So that is. That is particularly hard to measure, um, you know, kind of quote what the value of it is. In other settings, if you've got a clear objective, your goal here is to improve educational outcomes, that you can measure right. fairly well. And then if it's to more broadly improve social outcomes, that's going to take more time. The final thing I'd say is it's going to be easier to do this as uh, data becomes more um, omnipresent. In a world of big data, it, the feedback loops become uh, shorter. I mean, you still have to wait for the outcomes to happen, but the data gathering process is shorter and often more comprehensive, and more importantly, less expensive. So we'll be, we'll be able to have a better sense of uh, many of the outcomes, admittedly not perfect. And there is, I just want to highlight again, there is reason to be cautious there that, you know, uh, if you've hit an immediate objective and there's ambiguity about some longer term or broader objective, that doesn't mean you should shut down the program. Right. You know, Mike, one thing just to add that I found kind of inspiring in the last few years, uh, um, Bell Sawhill and, and Ron and the team at Brookings and, and uh, Results for America has been working with them, have developed something called the Social Genome Project, which actually looks at what have been the successful efforts that also have cumulative and stacking effects 
that over time help more Americans reach middle income by middle age. And what's interesting about it is it also identifies those interventions that haven't had um, such dramatic effects. And so I think a, a project like that that recognizes some things are very difficult to me measure. When you and I were visiting the Ginn Academy in Cleveland and we were having some of these discussions, the counselor came up to me and grabbed my arm and she said, honey, data is a child. <laughs> you know? And a child is a complex human being. Right. And I think sometimes the money ball approach is also interesting in identifying, for example, you know, right now in Capitol Hill, where you know they're they're having the debate around uh, uh, ESEA reauthorization, testing, and accountability systems. And Tim Shriver and others will tell you that the meta analysis show that uh, investments in social and emotional learning, probably a missing piece in American education, is something that has extraordinary gains even in in promoting academic achievement. Uh, social and emotional learning is actually hard to measure. And God forbid we have more assessments in schools, but uh, it's something that we know makes a significant difference. Grit, persistence, um, uh, discipline, uh, self-control, self-regulation. Let me ask a, another slightly uh, challenging question. Government performance has been a topic for a long time. Okay. What's different about the money ball approach that you're describing? And maybe, John, you could start by saying how it was different under President Bush and what was innovative in that era? Yeah. You know, it really is when first Michelle and others came up with this idea, I said, oh my god, come on, President Taft, Brownlow, two Hoover <laughs> commissions, a Grace Commission, the watershed of the Government Performance Results Act. I mean, there's been you know, a, a century or more of looking at uh, performance and effectiveness in government. I think what, what seems to us a little more refined in the money ball approach is that we're looking at uh, individual programs, practices, and policies, and looking at uh, building an evidence base around whether or not they are effective um, with different populations, different times, with different outcomes, and not so much at the department and agency level. You know, what's, what's the performance target for a department and agency? but what are the individual programs within um, the sphere of influence the government could invest in. President Bush, it was interesting, when, when Mike and I were uh, in these Oval Office briefings, um, and whenever we were proposing new State of the uh, Union initiatives or uh, investments in programs and policies, he always had the same three questions. Will this program achieve the results as advertised? Basically, what's the evidence base? Second, who's going to manage this program? And I'd say, well, the deputy secretary of such a, no, 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 what's the name of that person? He wanted to actually know the name of the person who would manage the program. And then what, what's going to be the mechanism for accountability to re, for results back to the taxpayer, back to the Congress, to the stakeholders? And so um, uh, through OMB, they came up with something called uh, PART, the Performance Assessment Rating Tool, that looked, I think, at the design um, the evidence base, and then the implementation of uh, more than a thousand programs. The good news was it actually influenced how um, the president's budget was set, and OMB determined whether to fund at what levels various programs. The bad news was there wasn't much cooperation with Congress, so it didn't inform the appropriations process. And Moneyball wants to take this beyond just a OMB exercise and have it inform um, the appropriations process as well. And, and, and how, is that, how is this fared on, in the Obama administration? How was that brought forward? Uh, read Ron Hoskins' book, uh, uh, yeah. so there, uh, where he really does lay out in great detail um, the emphasis on evidence and uh, the progress that's been made, again, from a modest base, but the trend is good. The, just to return to the, the previous question about, you know, haven't we seen this all before, and what's different now? I'd say there are three things that are different. The first one is that uh, it is easier to uh, uh, obtain data and to process it than ever before. We live in an era in which Google and others are constantly uh, running randomized control trials on how you're presented with information. It is easier to gather the information today than it was in a paper and pen uh, error. The second one is that we are under, uh, we will be under tighter fiscal constraints than at any time in modern history. Uh, Non-defense discretionary spending since 1962, the low has been 3.1 percent of GDP. The bipartisan agreement, the time, the path that we're on, uh, gets us to about two and a half percent of GDP by 2022. By the way, I don't think that'll happen. I think it would be undesirable if it did, but. 
there, there's more forcing pressure on these programs than ever before. And the final thing is, this can't kind of work in a vacuum. And so the fact that, as we were mentioning before, there's so much more outside interest, and there are organizations now uh, devoted solely to this activity mm -hmm. makes it different than before. It gives it a kind of community in which to thrive. I have to add a force with this, the evidence base is actually better over the last 30 to 40 years in a lot of areas. And um, there's a lot more to call from the research in terms of what is effective and uh, what could be effective. Uh, Peter, let me raise the kind of ideology political question, uh, why would Democrats be attracted to this as a theme and emphasis? Because if Democrats want to make the case to the American public that uh, their taxpayer dollars are being well spent and that uh, government works, you have to actually make sure government works. I mean, it comes back to your point about aid, uh, foreign aid. It's one of the areas where the American public dramatically exaggerate, or, uh, you know, if you go out and ask people what share of the budget is foreign aid, you'll get numbers that are an order of magnitude or two, you know, a lot more than what the reality is. And that's combined with the perception that it doesn't do anything. And unfortunately, you know, the evidence on the latter question is quite mixed. A lot of aid doesn't seem like it's actually produced uh, the intended effect. So if you are in favor of government working, which I would say is at the core of the democratic message, that we do need an effective government, if you believe in that, you got to do Moneyball because you have to be making sure that, that the programs are actually working. Uh, same question, John. Yeah. I mean, government working is not necessarily the <laughs> right. best Republican yeah. theme, but what, how does yeah. this fit into kind of uh, Republican? Well, I think you know, one um, of the mantras is cut wasteful government spending. And <laughs> one of the fears I've actually had is that um, Here's a good example. Uh, coming out of the Clinton New Markets Initiative, they created a program called Youth Opportunity Grants that disproportionately helped uh, disconnected youth in 36 communities, rural, um, uh, urban, and, and Native American uh, areas. And the program was actually cut because there weren't randomized controlled trials and a solid evidence base. And then they discovered in 2007 that the program had actually had very good outcomes with respect to reconnecting uh, these young people to educational outcomes, back to school and employment. It was and cut so, before we knew it worked. Yeah, it effectively, uh, so one of the worries I have on the Republican side is that you'll take the lack of a randomized control trial or, or strong evidence base for programs and the instinct will be let's just cut, all the pro cut these programs. When I think what we're advocating for is um, consistent with Republican principles are for limited, effective government. Uh, let's create an environment of continuous learning, building an evidence base. Uh, eventually, like the Even Start Family Literacy Program, multiple evaluations show that it wasn't working. Congress went on to spend a billion dollars over the next eight years on it. Finally, it was completely uh, cut. And so I think Republicans want to cut uh, wasteful spending and are for uh, limited and effective government and recognize at some level government has a role to play. And a poll from Kevin Madden in the book actually uh, shows extraordinary support for Republican investment in education reform. Are there some good examples of bipartisan agreement on these principles in, in approaching government that's had results? I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, one is across, go ahead. Pat. I was just gonna say Patty Murray and Paul Ryan yeah. have a mm -hmm. piece of legislation right. to uh, move more forcefully in this direction. That's a very rare uh, thing in, in today's Washington. What is the sorry? What is the legislation? They would create a commission, and they would they would uh, uh, they do a whole variety of things that are in line with the suggestions in the Moneyball book uh, to move towards more evidence based policymaking. Not all the way. Not all of our suggestions, but yeah. there's always room for improvement. Another Senator Warner, um, you know, very uh, driven um, by enterprise and innovation and data. And Senator Rob Portman and Kelly Ayotte have all been big supporters and I think are all stars of the Moneyball campaign. Uh, also very interested in these uh, pay for success and social impact bond models, which are very young. But uh, you all know this, but it, it basically um, instead of the taxpayer taking the risk, basically investors take the risk up front, invest in intervention, and then if it's effective, the government pays. Uh, for that success. And that's something that's attracted a lot of interest, particularly on the Republican side. So I think there's a lot of room for 
bipartisanship. Also under Head Start, Bush, uh, President Bush put in place um, basically evaluation of Head Start programs. And then President Obama um, basically asked the, the lowest performing 10% of Head Start programs didn't get automatically refunded but had to recompete. Uh, for funding kind of up their game according to these seven quality standards. So there's, again, been some bipartisan movement and cooperation across administrations as well. Just to dig one step deeper here, uh, can you address some of the built-in political obstacles here? Because politicians bring a lot of motives to the legislative process, and a lot of them are not related to outcomes, to put it mildly. Yeah. Okay? There, are, there are different sets of motivations that they bring. Can you break through that somehow? Uh, because this is why special interests exist. This is the, uh, the system we have, that a moneyed interests in our system. Can you break through that? Not perfectly. I mean, that, that will always be there, so let's just call a spade a spade. But I do think that you can still make progress. And the more that's kind of uh, built into the structure of the program, so uh, there will be an, uh, an evaluation done automatically. Uh, we will cut back on the lowest 10% of programs each, or, or of uh, performers each year and, um, and move to upgrade. The more that it's kind of structural as opposed to uh, yeah. fully discretionary, I think the better odds you are, have. And then finally, there's also um, it, the power of a story matters, but the power of a story and data combined is powerful even in a political context where there are lots of other uh, competing forces. So I don't want to hold out the false promise that, you know, the results will always win and, you know, th this is a panacea. It's not. But we are starting from such a low base that there's plenty of room for improvement, even taking into account the political constraints. Yeah, and John, you have in your Atlantic article some very specific uh, instances in which there was great political support for programs right. that had nothing to do actually with outcome. But right. I'm curious how. You know, yeah, we keep we that. keep talking about Ron Haskins' wonderful book. You should all right. read that. But he has um, a chart on one of the pages that shows his view of. Uh, what influences yeah. policy making and decision making? So interesting about it is, you know, the the uh, your um, committee chairman <laughs> and the leader of your party, you know, and what you get on the House floor when they distribute, you know, wh where the party is voting, uh, the special interests, the lobbied interests, uh, constituent interests, and then there's a little tiny slice that says the evidence. But we have this we have this little we have this little dream. I used to be a legislative director on the Hill, and we put a little format in place when we brief the member on bills that came before the House. And one section said uh, evaluation. And time and time again, that was blank. <laughs> and and we've been talking with uh, Michelle and Chiefman, part of this Moneyball campaign. What if you were to create a Moneyball index? It could be internal, and it could inform uh, members when they're making policy in committees, but also on that House floor and Senate floors when they go to vote. And it would simply, in a transparent way, and I think fully consistent with Alice Rivlin's wonderful principles around inclusiveness and transparency and all the things she advocates, um, would just list out to what extent this program or policy or practice actually has an evidence base, a solid evidence base so that members at least have that information as they go into the decision-making process. I know that sounds like such an obvious thing, but it would actually be a breakthrough. You could actually take it further and shame members of Congress, like you know, a Citizens Against Government Waste publication that would identify um, when members voted for bills that had no evidence base. But I don't think we're quite ready to go there yet. Hmm. Now, we've talked about one of the factors that might worry us about Moneyball, which is premature um, termination based on inadequate data or partial vision of what, what's going to be accomplished. Are there any other things out there that kind of worry you about this enterprise, about the, what, what pitfalls we have that need to be avoided? Well, I, I'll highlight one, which is that there's always going to be, and there is, tension between the gold standard of evidence, the randomized control trial, and anything that's not randomized. And you can get into this game and then basically say, the only thing that counts is randomized right. control trials evidence because that's the only way we can be sure that there's a causal connection. Um, and the problem with that is that randomized control trials cost a lot of money. They're, they often take a long time to uh, bear results. 
and uh, we're going to have to live with the fact that not everything can be, not everything can come from a randomized control trial. That's an inherent tension in anything that's evidence-based, which is uh, how do you weigh different quality evidence? Right. Or yeah, I, I would um, add to that that I, you know, my worry was that, the, as you mentioned, these the, the cost of a randomized control trial can be enormous, and there are a lot of organizations, and many here today, Lyft, communities and schools, city year, youth build, uh, who have um, some of whom have engaged in in randomized control trials, but as Jan Barron, I don't know if Jan's here, um, who runs the Coalition for Evidence Based Policy, and in the book, Glenn Hubbard and Gene Sperling identify very low cost, uh, very cost effective ways uh, to measure whether an intervention works. Let me give you a really, it may sound silly, uh, but it's in the book and it's, it's actually interesting. If you put a, a good looking bowl of fruit in front of a uh, lunch, uh, lunch line, the students who go through that line actually purchase more fruit and have better nutrition. If you give the students ability to send ACT scores to four instead of three colleges, which costs you know, like $7, uh, more students apply uh, to more selective colleges and end up going to one of those selective colleges. Josh Weiner's here working on how do we increase the matching between uh, low-income, high achievers who, who want to go on to, to uh, competitive colleges and community colleges. And they're actually simple things. The New York Times had an editorial the other day talk, talking about the power of nudging uh, small things we can do that are effective interventions and low cost. And I think we ought to look at those as well as the randomized control trials, comparative studies, uh, more cost intensive. Um, one last thing to mention, Jan also mentions that the government reports and collects so much data now. You can actually embed that data in your program at the outset on graduation rates, employment, um, a whole host of indicators in a low-cost fashion uh, to prove the efficacy of your program. I just have one addendum. Uh, Marilyn Moon has shown that the best way to get middle-aged men as opposed to uh, students to eat fruit is to put, it on the, put the fruit on the same refrigerator shelf as beer. <laughs> <laughs> Insights of data. Just FYI. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's middle-aged men. Yeah. Okay. Let me raise one tangent real quick here, which is, um, we're talking about money ball for government, but you're also talking about an ethos of outcomes yeah. when it relates to social services. Right. Uh, is, is this transferable to the private sector as well? There are a lot of private and religious institutions um, that also have not been very data oriented when it comes to donors, but also contracts from government. I'm just curious about how that might oh, kind of actually. Be that's my sense. biggest concern. Right. One of my biggest concerns. John right. Dulio just wrote this book called uh, "Bring Back the Bureaucrats." And because what he calls a government by Leviathan and proxy, when you look at the degree to which our government is actually contracting out uh, its services um, and the lack of accountability affiliated with that contracting out, it's actually quite a frightening <laughs> uh, set of scenarios. Um, and so I think that's one area. Also block grants and formula grants. I mean, Republicans love block grants. It's state and local flexibility and control. But you got to worry a little bit about accountability. So part of the agenda is in, to introduce into formula grants and block grants a sense of tiered evidence and accountability so that uh, we know that money is effectively used as well. There's a lot more that can be done, uh, including in the foundation world. Uh, a lot of the work John mentioned earlier uh, um, involving social impact bonds has, some, has not only local and state government involvement, but has some kind of foundation uh, involvement also. So again, we're starting from a low base progress. Um, and a lot of that's being focused on uh, social impact type uh, investing, where uh, the foundation, for example, will pay part of the um, part of the bonus, if you will, if recidivism rates are lower or if other outcomes are, are achieved. And that's one way of embedding, to your point, a culture of actually evaluating what you're doing uh, into, into uh, foundation worlds also. The other thing that I'd highlight, which we talk about in the book, is to have the government do what some foundations are already now doing, which is uh, being more oriented towards a prize rather than just a grant for achieving some objective. Mm. A prize is the ultimate um, kind of evaluation tool because you're only getting the money if you hit what you're trying to achieve. 
and we can do more of that. In fact, the Obama administration tried to move towards more uh, prizes uh, within government. Foundations, the, the best known of, obviously, is the X Prize Foundation, but lots of others are also moving in the same direction. Let me raise another question. We're getting close to the end here, and I want to get to some questions. But let me ask the effective advocacy question. How is it possible to build allies in Congress on this issue? How does this become a movement, um, not just a, a, you know, an intellectual construct? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. I think going to the, it gets back to your last question, Mike, which is going to the members of Congress who've actually had business experience, they've been driven by data and evaluation, and actually their you know, livelihoods dependent upon it. And I've noticed you know, Mark Warner and Rob Portman both come from the business world. They're very sympathetic to this approach. And I think that's um, one, um, you know, one way to approach it. Another is the, you know, Michelle did an extraordinary job bringing a, this, this group of people together across party, across administration, to advocate for this common idea. We didn't agree on everything. But we came together on a lot of um, uh, ideas. And I think that we feel like this represents an opportunity to break through the partisan divide. You know, Daniel Patrick Moynihan used to say, facts are stubborn things. And I think if you know, good-minded people are, are uh, <laughs> public-spirited people are presented with the merits of a case, and the human instinct is to actually want to help the populations, the policy of the program or the practices trying to advance, uh, that the merits could, can carry the day. And that may seem a little naive, uh, but we're building more and more support in the Congress and certainly the Obama administration. You know, people like Kathy Stack and others that have been embedding this in everything from pilot partnerships to how departments and agencies are reporting back on effectiveness and evaluations and rigor. And the Department of Labor, I think, has now adopted this up to 0.5% uh, of its budget will actually go in investing in evaluations. And we started a What Works Clearinghouse of the Department of Education. Margaret Spellings and I used to joke when it first got started, it's the Nothing Works Clearinghouse, because it was so <laughs> rigorous, nothing got posted. But I checked this morning, and there are quite a few programs that are posted today. So I think we're building momentum, both in uh, the administrations and uh, the congressional side. Do you have any thoughts on that issue about building advocates for this? Well, and uh, Bridget also mentioned earlier the possibility of money ball indices and other things that make it uh, more systemic and, and kind of easier to understand. Um, beyond that, I just, again, will reemphasize it re requires this outside community, which is now building um, in order to uh, move the Congress in, in what I consider to be the right direction. And that outside community didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago, and it's stronger today than it was even five years ago. And mayor, mayors and governors, you know, in this mm -hmm. chapter, Melody and I, Melody Barnes and I co-author, we talk about Sunnyvale, California. It has 300 metrics <laughs> that they, they, from potholes to first responders to books and libraries to uh, healthcare outcomes that they're driven by. And with efficient services at lower cost, um, a lot of effective outcomes, and, and so there's a momentum building around the country to get uh, mayors with city stat and uh, governors uh, using data in ways that they can become the laboratories of innovation and in turn inform uh, what Congress does. I remember our, our friend Mitch Daniels, when he was yeah. governor, uh, put a lot of emphasis on DMV wait times as a symbol of public accountability. Right. He'd get updates every morning of yeah. uh, the wait times at DMV and you know, dramatically drove those down, which became a symbol of effective government, government right. doing its basic job yeah. you know, well. Um, I, I think it, before we get to question answer, because we're talking about the outside community of advocacy here, um, I understand that Chivam Shaw from uh, the Results for America is in the audience and maybe would want to make a few comments right before we get to the She's questions. Right there, okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this great conversation. Uh, I, I'm actually just going to pose a question because we've covered so much great ground so far. And right. I'd love to follow up on this discussion you started about states and cities. Mm. Uh, we do often, we so often hear that the best ideas in Washington come from outside of Washington. So I'd love to hear you both comment a little bit about the capacity and will that you see at the state and city level for more deeply embracing Moneyball for government and what you see as the implications for the federal government. Yeah. Wow. 
uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, as you know, as the book discusses, there's been a, a lot of action at uh, the state and local level. Um, you know, and it's not, it's not, the trend is not always uh, in the right direction, I'd say. In, in New York, where I now spend most of my time, uh, we had an administration that was very firmly committed to this, and, uh, and that may be, you know, a little bit more of a challenge today than it was two or three years ago, even though uh, there's good progress. Um, but in other cities, uh, I got an email this morning about Boston. Um, there is, it's the obvious place to go um, when you're facing uh, constraints on your budget to make sure that what you're doing actually works. And there's more flexibility and ease of implementation at the state and local level than for a big national program. It's, you, can, you can implement rapidly and you can evaluate rapidly. And so you get a kind of almost instant feedback loop on what's working. It's interesting that um, it's in the book too and you've been part of achieving, but the, uh, Mayor Bloomberg um, looking at uh, anti-poverty programs in New York said that we're gonna um, move funding toward programs that have rigorous evaluation and away from programs that, that don't. And he actually did it. And the community got behind him and stakeholders got behind him. Um, and he had a very entrepreneurial person running it uh, that made it work. But I think one of the really powerful exercises, you know, coming out of Moneyball could be collect the Sunnyvales and the New York cities and uh, experiences in rural areas and, you know, different demography, demographies in the country about where local leadership is taking this approach. I was once in this Hope Street group meeting. We were talking about, um, uh, you know, the 47 different job training programs in the country. and. The fact that a lot of the states didn't actually even track whether people who got those investments actually got jobs. And Governor O'Malley, who was in, our, in the working group and took the time to be in our working group, pulled up his computer and had his stats. <laughs> uh, and was so data-driven in terms of his approach. And he was another example as a governor who was, um, I think, uh, someone who took the money ball approach. So I think building the case from the local and state level and informing the national debate would be smart as well. We'll take some questions now. You might as well stay and listen because we're obviously snowed in. So <laughs> Thanks for coming. And I, right here, third row. Right here. Yeah. Um, I'd like to say thank you for coming. Uh, I'd like to discuss, thank you, um, Moneyball and this uh, required national testing program that started under President Bush and then has gone on under President Obama. Um, basically, for a third grader, it takes seven hours over a two-week period to be tested. Um, is it really necessary to be testing all children in the United States in places like Greenwich, Connecticut, where perhaps 8 to 10 percent of the children are below grade level, like Forest, Illinois, and some other places? Uh, wouldn't it be better just to test and get data on children that are not performing well? Um, I'm going to date myself, but the Iowa test of basic skills used to be required in fourth, sixth, and eighth grade in major school systems. That correlated, believe it or not, to what the kid was going to get in, on his college boards. Yeah. Most school systems can tell you who is below grade level, and why do we need to be spending this kind of money and time on this kind of a program? Well, since we did it, I guess I better take it. Um, Margaret did it. It sounds, yeah. It sounds like you should be up testifying before Patty Murray's uh, committee. Um, I will say this. I think, you know, bringing it back to a money ball approach. When we were talking to Senator Kennedy and, and Congressman Miller and John Boehner and, and Senator Gregg about this, what Senator Kennedy and Congressman Miller were most interested in was the testing as it related to disaggregating the data and seeing the degree to which uh, minority subgroups were um, uh, performing uh, compared to their peers. And I will say that I think um, some testing, if someone can't read, <laughs> they can't learn any other subject. And so I think we need to have some testing, some comparability through NAEP across school districts and states. Uh, I think it has been overdone. There have been layers and layers and layers and layers of testing, uh, crowding out other subject matters. I've, American history and civics education is almost gone in this country. Uh, social and emotional learning is part of the secret sauce that's missing. 
Uh, but I think if you completely eliminate the testing regime, you know, we're, we're going against a money ball approach of having that really important data. But I think it's one piece. One other thing I'd say is um, the evidence now shows that early warning systems that look at attendance behavior and course performance and reading math based on grades um, actually are more predictive of uh, skills knowledge and graduation from high school than just those test scores. So I think we have to look at the indicia of other evidence and what's that, what that's telling us. And because of that data, 31 states now have early warning systems and uh, interventions are moving against those very students, the 50% of the dropouts who come from only 15% of the schools in the United States. And the president talked last night about you know, the highest graduation rates in history. There's been some significant progress in that pipeline over time. Uh, and again, I think part of it's based on building this evidence base and acting upon it. But I and think we have over-tested in the country. And if I could just add, I mean, one of the things that, uh, so for example, I'm on the board at New Visions in, in New York, and Bob Hughes there has built a, or is in the process of building, but has largely built a first-in-class data warehouse where you're predicting not only, it's not just the early warnings, uh, uh, itself, but an early warning yeah. to the early warning. Right. So what, what things trigger on that, you can, that you'll be able to observe in a student that then leads to the absenteeism, that then leads right. to uh, problematic behavior. scores and other outcomes? And uh, the more that you, you're in a kind of digitized world where it's, it's easier to see things in real time, the better off you're, you are from that perspective. And that might ease some of the pressure on, um, on other, you know, the more traditional test scores themselves. Maybe we can wait for a. Yes, this is a wonderful uh, presentation, and good luck for it. I'm a little. <laughs> I'm a little. Good I'm a little. Good luck. Yeah. We I'm need little, your help. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm a little skeptical because I think that so many government programs I've seen over the years, um, there's no. There's no agreement on what the goal of the program is. And I'll take Head Start. I was involved in Head Start in the anti-poverty program in the 60s. Right. All right? It was clear what the goal was. Yeah. Give poverty kids who <clears throat> are there a chance to uh, do better in school. That was it. All right? And so uh, the evaluation in the early 70s showed that by seventh grade, those po uh, poor kids who went to Head Start were no better off than poor kids who didn't go to Head Start. All right. So then people came and moneyball people and said, OK, program doesn't work. Let's scrap it. Oh, no. It's a very good dental program. It's very good for inoculations and everything like that. OK. So then we had other programs for dental and inoculations. And now it's talking about character and then college rates and all that. By the time you get through with all these, uh, you know, what the program is for, Meanwhile, you're, what is it, 30 years, 40 years down the road, every president has jacked up Head Start uh, with, you know, with no finding of results from the original you know, agreement on what it was for. So all programs can find something good with all the money after many years. You know, the March of Dimes keeps going even though polio is solved. And so you, you keep going uh, because you have all this money and people think it's a good idea. So there's no evaluation because there's no real agreement on what a program is supposed to do. I'll just say quickly, what, one of the things I liked about PART, this performance rating assessment tool, was the first question it asked was, what's the goal? What concretely is the goal of the program of the policy or the intervention? And, 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 and second, what is the strategy to get to that goal? So at least, and you're right, at least there, there, was, there was some kind of process put in place to examine those questions. And I think fuzziness around goals and what, we're, what we've been trying to achieve is actually part of the problem that Moneyball's trying to address. Peter, I, do you have a response on that? Because you addressed it. Well, I guess a, a couple things. I agree that there's always the risk of mission creep and sort of unclear uh, boundaries. On the other hand, uh, my read of the evidence today is that uh, from a cost-benefit analysis, if you incorporate the later effects, uh, this pro high quality Head Start programs are very much worth the money. So that, I, I'm torn on the sense of, that, that's an example of where I, w I wouldn't have actually ex post or after the fact thought that it would be a good idea that we uh, cut back on it. 
the biggest indictment or the biggest problem, the biggest shortcoming is that uh, fade out effect around grade seven, eight, nine. And the real question is, why is that happening? Is it, is it uh, that any benefit that you get needs to be perpetuated with higher quality schools later on? Or is it just that an effect is ephemeral uh, regardless of the subsequent educational um, environment, what have you? Uh, that's a hard question to answer. So bottom line, I agree with you that mission creep occurs. In this particular example, I'm sort of uh, glad that we allowed mission creep to occur because I think the evidence shows that uh, across a wide variety of outcomes, it, the program's worth it. But the more you question it, the more you have, let's look at this and let's look at yeah. that, the less accountability there's going yeah. to be. Let me go on this side, maybe in the back there. Mm -hmm. Um, hi, I work at the National Academy of Sciences, which mm. likes to think of itself as the gold standard yeah. for evidence-based decision making. Unfortunately, we have a, a process that's extraordinarily slow and, and cumbersome. I'm and in therefore, the middle of one of them. Yes, yes. <laughs> me too. <laughs> so, and, too well and, aware of it. and as a result, people, I mean, come to us less often to do evaluations, but they do go, I know, to places like Research Triangle Institute or Mathematica or RAND, where they can get rapid studies. But colleagues there tell me that often when they do their studies, the results are not made public. And so there is evaluation being funded. This is particularly true in Medicare and Medicaid. And I wonder, is, is this common in other um, government agencies? And how extensive is it even with Medicare and, and Medicaid work? It, it's something we haven't spent as much time on, the application of these di ideas to healthcare, which yeah. I know you are very interested in. But I'm. Right. I, I, I would say it, it always troubles me when an evaluation is done. So let me put it this way. I have done a variety of randomized controlled trials and other evaluations with uh, corporate sponsors. And <coughs> ground rule number one is the results will be published regardless of what they show. Because the whole point here is, I mean, we don't need to list the company. And we can provide other kinds of anonymity. But the, the whole point here is to provide, to deepen the evidence base. And if you're not publishing it, or you're not making it public in some way, uh, that's contrary to the whole goal. Um, I'm aware of some limited examples where that's not the case. It's uh, you know, uh, troubling, I think, wherever. Let me put it this way. That should raise a red flag wherever and whenever it does occur. Uh, my experience suggests it's more prevalent in um, biotechnology than in healthcare services, so I'm a little bit surprised by the sort of Medicare and Medicaid, but my point, the broader point is wherever it happens, it, it should raise immediate red flags. Yeah. I would just add, I'd love to defend the academy. I'm in the middle of a civic health working group, and the people that the academy has been able to assemble is just extraordinary. It's been a slower process, but the results have been extraordinarily thoughtful, and I think we'll have you know, long-term effects in terms of designing uh, civic engagement policies and the country understanding civic health in ways it hasn't done before. So hats off to the academy. But second, I think with this um, expenditure of up to 1% of funding for evalu rigorous evaluations in departments and agencies, it's incumbent upon us, it's a wonderful idea, to make sure that part of that policy is that any uh, study undertaken um, shall be publicly available, shall be published, uh, that that's a condition of the investment in that evaluation process. And the, the obligation, just like these, these um, independent actors and departments and agencies, chief evaluation officers should be given instructions to ensure that that happens. Let, let's go with the, like, back there a little bit. So I work for a bureau of the Department of Treasury that focuses on community and economic development. We would love to do randomized trials, to do a longitudinal study or a panel study, and quite honestly, get the financial and economic data from everybody to collect. Well, that's a burden, and there's a public burden, the PRA, that we, it just is difficult for us to get through the process, the clearance process, to allow us to get and collect that data. So there's that level of, should the federal government be collecting how much data? And we would love it, but it's at odds at the current sentiment and us being able to do it. So is there any, how would you respond to it with the whole Public Re uh, Paperwork Reduction Act, PRA, and the burden to the public of collecting data? So I'll take a crack at that. Um, again, part of 
the answer here is that it is becoming easier than it was historically. The burden uh, is easier uh, and, and lower on people um, just because uh, the technology is advancing. Another part of the answer is um, the government needs to do a better job of incorporating data and evidence from other private sector data aggregators. So it is striking to me that our GDP statistics, for example, are still based on uh, surveys of businesses when there are real-time indicators of uh, business activity that are arguably more accurate, including, for example, in healthcare, where we had a massive mistake that the Bureau of Economic Analysis made in the first quarter of this year that was entirely avoidable, and I'm saying this because I've I said it publicly at the time before the revisions happened, based on what was already publicly available from large hospital chains, from large insurance companies, what have you. We don't tap that information enough because we're worried about biases sure. and what have you. But the fact of the matter is, in today's world, we should. And uh, we need to figure out some way in which the traditional government survey approach can be combined with private sector data so you know, all the major credit scoring bureaus, Experian, TransUnion, what have you, have a ton of information on the people that you're going to go out and ask for the same information. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go in the front row here. I'm Mitzi Wirth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School, but I'm actually building an ad hoc team to examine the education that is given to kids in the academies, whether or not it reaches 21st century needs. But that's an aside. Mm. Um, I think the media has a big part to play in this, because you need to tell us what's going on. And my own experience with getting big reports is nobody can read them anymore because they don't have time. So I think any report that is done for any department, you need to have up front two paragraphs or up to a page and a half which says, what were the new learnings and what are the things that ought to be changed based on all the money we've spent? And maybe you could write an article about that. <laughs> I, I, a little I would, pressure on the moderator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would respond that it is a, a generally a good principle to make things easy for the media. Um, you can never uh, <laughs> overestimate their uh, patience. Uh, in, in something like this. So I, I think that that's a really good idea. Uh, we often depend, to be honest, on uh, people like the people on this stage who are capable of spanning that gap between you know, the science of data and uh, public explanation. Um, so RCTs we, will stand for a result containable in a tweet. Right. <laughs> uh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Don't have time to read them. Yeah. But it's the, it, 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 it is, by the way, it's the reason we d depend on experts who, who uh, you know, do actually have time to read the reports. And, uh, it's, um, and sometimes that information is not mediated in a, in a usable form. So I, I agree with the in analysis. So I'm going to go here in the front. So. So I like the money ball example where, for example, there are real quantified things in the baseball, wins above replacement, on base yeah. plus slugging. There's a difference, though, it seems to me, which is that if I'm the Washington Nationals looking for a new second baseman, I can apply those to hundreds of second basements. And so my question is, in government, if I really want to consider to take a money away from something that the Congress finds to be a terrific, important program for their constituents, even if it's running poorly, they may not take the money away from it unless there are clear alternatives. And so my question to you is, taking a, a, a real example, let's say cleaning up the Chesapeake, and let's say I know a little bit about it, the USDA is involved, National Science and Foundation is involved, NIH is involved, what do you know, EPA is involved. How would you find all the alternatives in government, all the different programs that touch on a topic area? And I think you, Bridge, said something about 220 right. some odd yeah. job training programs. How do you find them all and then yeah. figure out yeah. which one's best so you can choose the best second baseman? Yeah. Boy, that's a great question. <laughs> it is. Um, we love the Billy Bean analogy because he, you know, he couldn't outspend him, but he could outsmart him. And it was interesting when he discovered, when he brought in that bright statistician that you know, on-base percentages and stolen bases mattered more than home runs or the you know, scouting reports about how charismatic somebody was. 
Um, but I think your point is really, really well taken. I had this one little experience in the context of trying to help uh, steer the federal machine toward helping vulnerable, disadvantaged youth. And we discovered these 339 programs, um, many of which we, didn't, we weren't aware of, um, many of which we very, knew very little about, and then many of which had, uh, most of which had almost no evaluation. So we, even if we wanted to do the right thing in terms of federal investment, we didn't have enough government couldn't play Moneyball. So what we're trying to do is create the conditions under which uh, you could actually identify those you know, 30 second basemen you could choose from, those uh, programs that the federal government is already funding or that ought to be funding, and lift up the evidence base both in the public sector but also the private sector. The private sector is spending an enormous amount of money now in, in funding research and programs, and like the AT&T Aspire program is working on making education a data-driven dri enterprise and funding uh, studies and work that lifts up the evidence base of these community-based programs. Um, so I think that's, we're trying to create a playing field from which government can actually play money ball, but we're not, we're not there yet. I, I would only add there when, in the Bush administration, when, it, for example, democracy promotion was a major presidential priority. We asked an yeah. interdepartmental process to produce all of the democracy promotion programs across the government. I think it took a year and a half yeah. uh, to produce that information. And then a bunch of the programs were only put in budget category of democracy right. promotion. It had nothing to do with yeah. the actual topic. It was a, it was a budgetary um, category. Um, you know, so even on central presidential priorities, it was very, very difficult sometimes to do that. We found, and this is not true in every area, that presidential initiatives sometimes could cut through those things yeah. where you put somebody in charge and you have outcomes that you're expecting. And that was true on the President Blair initiative, true on PEPFAR, true on a, lot, a variety of things where you put somebody in charge and Bridge is exactly right. With Bush, it was always aligning resources, responsibility, and accountability. That's what he asked for in every circumstance. Somebody had to be in charge, they had to have enough money, and they had to be held accountable for results. That was his own, that was the approach that he brought. We use that as ad hoc foreign assistance reform, okay, in presidential initiatives, because we couldn't reform the whole system. It was, it was too difficult. Um, but it is, it was, it, a difficult preliminary step just to determine what the government did yeah. in, in, uh, on some of these topics. I have so, to add just quickly, uh, it, on this White House Council for Community Solutions for President Obama, we collected all the information about the federal response to these 6.7 million young people who were disconnected from school and work and costing taxpayers $93 billion a year. We did 36 community-based hearings, and what were we, we were told again and again was that the, uh, what's your biggest challenge? We thought it was going to be give us more resources. The answer was break down the silos and the barriers across all these programs on eligib eligibility and uses of funds so that we can serve these populations in a more holistic way. That the federal, the, 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 the depth of federal programs actually was a barrier to communities being nimble and effective in serving these populations. So. Well, the theory behind the question is that the Data Act will give us a chance by saying, where do we spend the money? Okay, let's find the places we spend the money on these 228 different programs, right. and then we have that story. Yeah. I'm afraid, though, the government won't go far enough by saying the Data Act must use kind of a, a universal dictionary. So, you know, if it's job training, yeah. you only get one choice of job training. You can't have three different alternatives. Yeah, so. right. Okay. We need you on our team. Let me go in the back over here, maybe. I want to go back to Peter okay. Orzag's statement that uh, we have to live with the fact that not everything can be judged by a randomized trial. And it's not just new fighter planes that can't be judged that way. It's a lot of stuff closer to home, the place-based stuff like promised neighborhoods and choice yeah. neighborhoods. And when you, in fact, tear down the silos, it becomes much harder to evaluate elegantly. And I want to know, what do you do about the fact that we still prioritize everything that we can judge with randomized trials and put that in the highest, uh, in, in, uh, give that the highest priority. How do we keep some of these things that may be more promising but are harder to evaluate? How do we keep them on the top of the agenda? I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Uh, I think first by acknowledging and, and, and very clearly stating that not everything has to be RCTs. I, I would note, by the way, even on place-based, um, 
it, just because, again, it's, it's illustrative. Um, first, there was the moving to opportunity uh, randomized control trial, which at least speaks to some degree to place-based uh, policies. Uh, more importantly, random, randomization doesn't have to happen at the level of the individual. It can happen at the level of you know, which community is chosen and which not. That all having been said, and I'm, I'm agreeing with you that in lots of examples, RCTs are not going to work or they're not appropriate or they cost too much or what have you. Um, I think we just need to embrace that. And that's why uh, there is a kind of, um, you know, there, there's a, a spectrum of quality of evidence. And the evidence that comes from, huh, we did this within this geographic boundary. And then right over the edge of that boundary, we didn't do it. And the outcomes were substantially different on this side of the street or that side of the street. That's not randomized, but that's pretty good evidence, in my, in my opinion, it, and as an example. And then you, know, you go all the way down to the simple observational study of, well, this happened here, and it's associated with this, therefore it worked, which becomes more problematic. So it's a, it's a spectrum, and we need to embrace that. We, we cannot just say RCTs are the only thing that counts. And I would just highlight Gene Sperling in the book yeah. has a chapter on the continuum approach. This right. is his very worry <laughs> that not everything is subject to an RCT, even those things that are. Uh, we ought to be careful and create an environment of learning. And that there are a lot of low cost things that we can do, building what Peter said, that build a little bit of an evidence base to prove your proposition. Because I think we're, we're moving more and more to a world where even for promised neighborhoods and the, the examples you cited, you're going to have to marshal some evidence for their continuation. OK, we'll do one or two more questions. Let's, any from this side here that we have? OK, maybe right here, second row. We do in the front here. You know, often humans are quite ingenious at applying their creativity to get around new sets of rules and regulations to wit IRS tax codes, SEC regulations, and they are often capable of quickly subverting their intent. Do we have any evidence to show that an, a money ball approach to government will be something more than ephemeral? And are there steps to keep it from being quickly subverted by that human creativity? Yeah. That's interesting. Well, One little human creativity, the evidence of, so when you, uh, Gene Sperling cites this in his chapter, when you tell uh, taxpayers, who, uh, Americans who aren't filing, that most Americans in the United States are law-abiding and file their taxes. It actually boosts the filing rates. <laughs> it's just interesting. I mean, it's a, it's a use of uh, low-cost, simple evidence to change behavior. Um, Peter, you'll have I was going to say, I agree with you that any set of rules will ultimately be, be manipulated, and uh, that you know, should be accepted also. Uh, we're so early in this process that we haven't fully reached that stage yet. Um, I'd also note, I mean, for example, I ran the Congressional Budget Office. The scoring rules are a good example of a discipline that's supposed to be imposed on the process. Now, they are manipulated from time to time. But I'd say, by and large, they still are a healthy discipline. Maybe you know, 90%, not 100% effectiveness, because people play games with them. But that's the kind of uh, ratio that I expect out of this sort of effort. Yes, there will be efforts to kind of get around the rules. But uh, if there were more commitment here, I think it, it would still be, uh, it'd still have a large impact. And by the way, that also highlights something we haven't mentioned, which is another indirect benefit of building out the evidence base is that it informs that CBO scoring process also. If you're an advocate for a program and you have solid evidence that it produces uh, particular outcomes, that can feed into uh, the CBO evaluation in a way that can be quite helpful. One more quick question. Let's go here. Now we can, maybe we can wait for a, for a microphone here. Mm -hmm. So the question I have is about what to do with what doesn't work. Um, and obviously, that's a question we need to tackle to be able to promote what does work. And so I think that that's, a, for me personally, I think that that's a, a tough one because knowing enough about evaluation, you know that sometimes there's powerful ideas that failed, in, failed to execute. And so then that's true across the board. So how do we, you know, what are some of the questions you all, you might ask when addressing that issue in terms of uh, when do you dismantle, when do you replace, when do you improve? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting to be a Republican to say this, but I, I, um, I think the danger I fear is um, the extremists in my party 
uh, taking um, evidence and or a lack of random, randomized control trials and using that as an excuse to completely eliminate a program that is serving perhaps not as effectively as it ought to be, but in some way serving vulnerable populations that then immediately have no safety net or no resources or no support. So one of the things that this campaign carefully advocates is a, uh, we want to create an environment, it's not going to be an on-off switch. It's one of continuous learning and development. And the kind of questions I would want to know is, um, uh, what, what was the strategy and the goal to begin with? Who are we trying to serve for what purposes, under what circumstances, and why? Um, what, how was this program designed to achieve those objectives? What was the evidence base that underlined, uh, under, was underlying the interventions? And then were those interventions actually uh, implemented with fidelity and quality? Because interestingly, a lot of the first four questions can be answered well, but if the program is not implemented with fidelity, as you know from experience, you, know, you can quickly fall off in terms of your, your performance. So that's the thing when Mike asked, what are you most worried about in the Moneyball approach? That question uh, highlights uh, what I'm worried about. And I would just say, uh, I like more the kinds of approaches. Uh, Mike mentioned one, um, uh, Bridge had mentioned another, uh, in which you're looking at the bottom 10% of uh, providers within a program and trying to cull them. Uh, each year or each evaluation period. I think the risks that you're talking about are more prevalent when it's an on-off switch for an entire undertaking. Sometimes that will be appropriate also, but uh, there's lower risk, uh, to my mind at least, of the sort of more culling approach um, each year rather than a hard on-off switch. Great. Okay, well, thanks again to the Aspen Institute and the Gildenhorns for making this uh, dialogue possible to Results for America, Mich Michelle Jolin and her team for leading this effort, and to uh, Peter and Bridge for all you're doing to promote it. Um,